G'day pals, today I want to tell you a story. A story about a game that changed the action-adventure genre forever. This game was polarizing and unconventional on release, but did something that no modern action game had done to this day. This game achieves a relationship with the player, it contours drama, pulling tension and releasing it in ways that I've never experienced before. This game does this through level design alone, so today we'll be talking all about it. Strap in, get some food, maybe a drink, because today we'll be exploring this landscape and the game itself in detail. It's October in 2011. We are reaching the peak, sort of the tail end of the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era. Action games in this generation had become somewhat formulaic. Advances in computing technology and in tooling, most of all, meant that games like the Batman Arkham series, Uncharted, and Assassin's Creed essentially paved the way for how the action game would evolve in this era. Games were more cinematic, they were more dynamic, and essentially more of a power fantasy. Players could engage in flashy combat and execute amazing combos in a way that made you really feel like you were Batman. One of the hallmarks of games made in this era was the trend in enemy AI design, such that enemies would kind of cluster around the player and take turns approaching them. This meant that players had more agency, they could execute more interesting combos and really wail on a guy without worrying about getting stabbed in the back. Enemy AI became a little more sluggish and slow, while player controllers became more flashy. I want to call out though, in these games, typically, this meant that level design spaces were more open. Games like God of War and Dante's Inferno would opt for these arena style spaces where the player could really execute their uh, combat prowess with as little distraction as possible. And nothing gives away games from this generation like the combo counter on the left hand side of the screen. Even Batman itself, which was touted as a more gritty game, featured this almost Tony Hawk style combo counter on the left. Reflecting on games that had released only a few years prior, like the Prince of Persia Warrior Within, modern gaming had become a little bit more homogenized, less about navigating through perilous pathways, and more about providing the player with a greater sense of agency and cinema. Console action games had found a formula that worked, and for the most part, players were more than happy to oblige. That was until a certain game released in late October. If you were thinking that the game we might be referring to today is Skyrim, you can think again, because today we'll be discussing level design in Dark Souls. Though you could be forgiven for making this mistake, because around this time, the comparisons between the two games were stirring the media up into a frenzy. Infamously, IGN wrote an article titled Top 5 Reasons Dark Souls Will Eat Skyrim's Face. The article compares the two in a number of factors, like whether they have online multiplayer, whether they have dragons in them, uh, the degree of tension in combat, uh, as well as the open, sprawling world and uh, the scope of the games. To be honest, these days, I don't think this is a very apt comparison at all. Uh, these games are very different, Skyrim being far more a Western first-person RPG, uh, where Dark Souls being a third-person JRPG, mostly an action game with RPG elements. They're very separate experiences, although you can see at this point in time in the industry, those differences may not have been as important to players or to the media. Upon its release, one of the factors that seemed to resonate with both media and players alike was Dark Souls' crushing difficulty. In this era of finely tuned power fantasy action games full of convenience, Dark Souls made a name for itself by being completely unapproachable, completely inaccessible, completely opaque. Even the control layout for this game was considered bonkers for the time. I mean, no game prior to 2011 dedicated primary combat abilities, melee abilities, to triggers and shoulder buttons. I mean, this was unheard of, but it got people talking. Gamers would consider Dark Souls a challenge, something to be surmounted. It was synonymous with the most difficult, most hardcore games, and even to this day, the concept of a game being the Dark Souls of some genre is popular in game design and game marketing. But today, I don't really want to talk to you about the horrible platforming. I don't want to talk to you about the janky animations, the brutal, unfinished areas of the game. Today, I want to talk to you about level design. 
particularly one feat of level design that I believe makes this game a classic. There are no perfect games, but classic games do something memorable. And moments in gaming that stand at the center of those memories are worth celebrating. So, are you ready? Dark Souls begins with a cutscene describing the state of the world when the player inhabits it. This fantasy world of Lordran has succumbed to a curse known as the Dark Sign. This curse threatens to snuff out the flame of the world, life itself, and those who are afflicted with the curse, those carrying the Dark Sign, are committed to an asylum where they live out their days as undead. The player inhabits one of these undead, and through mere chance or perhaps destiny, they are given the opportunity to escape their confines and go to find a way to reverse the curse and perhaps rekindle the flame, alighting the world anew. But not yet. For now, these are only visions. The player is merely a shambling horror sitting in a cell. This is who we inhabit. An undead covered in rags, scrounging around through sewers, reading control descriptions on stains on the floor. The player learns to swing a sword, climb a ladder, roll around, before they learn their most important lesson, death. Behind the first door of the game lies a boss that first time players have essentially no hope of beating. This is the game basically making its mission statement to the player. You will die. You will die over and over and over again. Even the NPCs that aren't dead are dying or going crazy or both. The game imposes on the player almost immediately a sense of oppression. The setting, the tone, the soundscape, the lighting, everything about the game basically gears you up for a bad time. After what must feel like hours in this tutorial section of the game, players are finally relieved of the asylum and whisked away to the main section of the game. Upon arrival in Lordran, Unlike the Asylum, the player actually is given multiple paths they can proceed down. The only real instruction that the game gives the player is in the form of this lowly warrior here. The game tells the player to ring two bells of awakening, one above and one below, and no more than that. The two paths that lead down to the catacombs or to the New Londo ruins are full of enemies that you basically can't kill. They will either die and respawn or be intangible altogether. So the only path that you can actually feasibly go down is the path up. The Undead Berg marks the start of an extremely long passage of gameplay that's for the most part very linear. It is more or less a gauntlet of enemies, one after another, after another, after another. There are multiple bosses on this path. You will die many times and the only solace is the fact that when the enemies respawn their behavior is somewhat formulaic. Go through this tunnel, watch out for the rat on the left, go up these stairs, watch out for the hollow on the right. The game becomes kind of a choreography, right? Where the player and the game itself enter into this dance. But all along, the player gets further and further and further away from the starting bonfire, the save point of the game. Truly, once the player enters the undead berg, they will eventually realize that the filing shrine they just left was the only place in the game where there were no enemies, the only place where they get any kind of sense of reprieve. Because from here on in, there are enemies everywhere, around every corner, and you'll never know what's coming unless you've played the game before. And this tension is something that the game constantly reminds the player of, that around every corner, up the top of every staircase, there might be something horrible waiting, right? There is danger everywhere. This tension that it creates in the player is very deliberate. Over time, the distance between you and the first point of safety in the game, the last point of safety in the game, grows longer and longer and longer. Now, the game does have save points called bonfires, and when the player sits at a bonfire, all of the enemies are respawned, but their health is restored, and most importantly, their healing flask, the Estus flask, is also replenished. When the player dies, they are returned to the last bonfire that they saved at. Meaning if they don't make it to the next bonfire before dying, they have to redo that entire section of the game. It should be noted that despite the fact that there are bonfires in the Undead Berg and in the following Undead Paris sequence of the game, the bonfires are not all created equal. 
In fact, the Firelink Shrine Bonfire, the first one that you start at, allows you to heal 10 times, while all of the subsequent bonfires only let you heal 5 times. So there's a kind of grace that the game gives you here, even though it's difficult, even though you will die many, many times, that it actually removes beyond this section of the game. Again, more tension, more oppression, the game constantly lays on the player. After finally making it through the Undead Berg, and after a number of jump scares and barrels exploding in their faces, the player finally makes it to this spiral tower. They make their way up the tower, they get spun around a few times, and they face the first boss proper in this game. This is the Taurus Demon. This is a giant axe-wielding demon thing on the top of this parapet that the player must face while being assailed by crosswomen from up at the top of a tower. It's not an easy fight. The player will probably die many times. I've been pushed off the rails once or twice in this fight. And uh, that's Dark Souls. You know, it's tough. But eventually, after besting the Taurus Demon, the player finds not a bonfire, but a bridge. A bridge guarded by a fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> this is a pretty traumatic experience. And the player must actually face down the dragon before proceeding to the rest of the game. The dragon is too far away to kill. Its flames are too hot to survive. The player can try to run past it, or they can try to take the stairs down they will eventually find another set of stairs leading down to a ladder. This ladder goes down to a bonfire, but it's not a new bonfire. It's actually a bonfire they've already visited, the last bonfire they visited, and it's the one after the Firelink Shrine. This is kind of a weird moment for most players. If you've been playing this game for the first time, there's no way you're paying attention to the actual routing. You've been going on a pretty linear path, but that line in 3D space doesn't go straight. It kind of goes all the way around. And making it to this bonfire feels kind of weird. It's almost like, huh? Here? How did I get here? When the player ascends the ladder again, they are essentially continuing the gauntlet. The linear path continues forward underneath the dragon this time, where pretty much it's just more enemies, more numerous enemies, more advanced enemies that pose particular challenges to the player and teach them different things about the game. There are poisonous rats, there's an armored boar, there are bolder knights with parry attacks, there's a giant knight with a giant mace. It's all a bit traumatic and a bit sadistic, but if the player has gotten this far, then they're also kind of a masochist. For me personally, I really enjoyed the way that the combat is so slow and methodical. It really makes the positioning aspects of the game much, much more prominent. Games like Devil May Cry and Kingdom Hearts really allow the player so much agency, whereas Dark Souls really forces you to make your choices in very deliberate ways. The game pushes the player down these very narrow pathways. It makes them make very deliberate choices. Do I block here? Do I parry? Do I roll? Do I roll in or do I roll out? The enemies aren't that complicated. They're very simple, they're not very flashy, their movesets are kind of telegraphed, so once the player learns to overcome that initial fear, that initial tension, the space for making decisions is actually quite clear. It feels good to beat these enemies, it feels like you have control and agency once you understand the rules of the game. But the game is still hard, maddeningly hard, and you will die. Many many, many times. When the player finally makes it to the top of the parish, the game stops playing around, and it stops playing fair. In this fight against the Bell Gargoyles, there's not one, but two bosses. Two bosses simultaneously. It's madness. It's maddening. This is the trial by fire that really makes or breaks the player's resolve. Up until this point, you know, the player may adopt the idea that if they just get good, right? If they just dodge at the right times, if they just do the right stuff, they can beat the game, right? And the designers must have intended it for it to be this way. But at this fight, the game of chicken kind of breaks down and the player is kind of forced to pursue alternative means. If the player heads down the set of stairs from the bonfire that they find in the Undead Parish, they are met with Andre of Astora. He upgrades your gear and actually allows you to, you know, do more damage for the first time in the game. But a lot of the time in Dark Souls, and especially for new players, it's not really about how much damage you can do, but how many hits you can take. And at this point in the game, 
You really need to be able to take more than five. I want to pause the story right here. This moment, in my opinion, is probably the most important moment in all of Dark Souls. Let me reiterate, at this point in the game, the player has most likely spent five, six hours going down an essentially linear path. There's been a little hint of a shortcut here and there. There's been one or two bonfires. The player has their hardest fight ahead of them that they are least prepared for. They are the furthest from home they have been thus far, and the difficulty is being laid on as thick as it has been. This is Breaking Point. I'm now going to show you a number of YouTuber Let's Play reactions to this particular part of the game. We could just keep hanging out. Is this an elevator? Oh, no, 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 wait, wait, no! Fuck! I don't okay. know if that was a good idea. You got lifts? Okay, okay. Oh! Never mind. Oh! We're going down. Hey, I don't want to go down. I want to go up. No! No, 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 no! It did it! Oh no! Guys, I'm scared. Uh, this is a lot longer than I thought it was gonna be. Oh, I'm back at the Firelink Shrine. <gasps> Firelink Shrine? So bizarre. Wait, I've been here. Wait, what? Firelink Shrine. Wait a minute, I've been here before. Oh, I'm home. Oh, no shit. My God, I'm not so scared now. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Oh? Oh yeah, it is. We got big yeah, boy right here. Hi, buddy. <gasps> We're making fire link. Oh, this is so blessed. I mean, what a moment. Like, from something so unassuming comes such a consistent reaction of relief, of gratitude, of surprise, confusion, wonder. What an amazing thing that this game achieved with something so unassuming. And it starts with a pressure plate elevator that closes the door behind you as soon as you walk in. And then a descent dropping you straight down. Most players are thinking, no, 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 no. I don't want to go down. I'm trying to go up. I don't know what's down at the bottom of this pit. It's fear, it's panic, followed by suspicion, followed by recognition. The title card, Filing Shrine, dispels all of the guesswork. And finally, we have elation. We are where? We're home. Home? In Dark Souls? How is it that a game that's been nothing but torture can give the player such relief simply by giving them a path back to a place that they've been before? Make no mistake, this is not a coincidence. This is extremely deliberate level design and I'm dying to break down the best kept secret of this magic trick. Dark Souls, like most games, chunks its levels. This means that certain parts of the world are loaded at different times to other parts, basically to save on memory. But Dark Souls does something that's kind of phenomenal. Throughout all of this level chunking, Dark Souls' geometry respects Euclidean space. That is to say, when you go from Firelink Shrine through the Undead Burg, through the Undead Parish, and down that elevator, you are actually going through real geometric space. There's no warping, there's no teleports. You walked that way, and you managed to end up right back at the start. This linear path, this gauntlet of level design, this chunk of five hours of gameplay that was getting harder and harder the more you played, was actually a big loop. And at this point in the game, the greatest upgrade that you're given, the greatest utility that the player is given in an RPG, is not an item, it's not experience points, it's a pathway back to the start of the game and the boost to the player's morale as they head back to those gargoyles with five extra Estus flasks isn't the actual greatest benefit that the player gets at this point in the game. It's not the reason why players continue beyond this point to go on to face Anor Londo and to conquer Dark Souls. With this elevator, Dark Souls makes a promise to the player that it's not just a gauntlet. It's not just a linear path, that it pays to explore, that it pays to remember where you've been and where you're going that the game is a modern day Metroidvania. This is the confirmation of an extremely important dynamic between the designers and the player throughout the playthrough of Dark Souls. 
that the player, by being resourceful, can actually mitigate the difficulty of the game. It's a stroke of genius, an incredible trick that they play on the player. In order to achieve this sense of relief, the player has to be confused about where they're going. They have to have no sense of bearings. And that trick is achieved with this tower. There are multiple towers in this game with basically the same geometry. These spiral towers that have no way of seeing what's outside until you hit the top. They're basically there just to spin the player around. While the player is traveling through the undead berg, looking around every corner, trying to avoid enemies and jump scares, they really have no hope of understanding the fact that this passage that they're walking under is underneath a bridge. And when they cross that bridge, there's no way they make the connection that that's the same bridge they were walking under moments earlier. So when they finally do make those connections, it's bewildering, it's incredible. I mean, just take a second here. From this vantage point above the Taurus Demon boss fight, the player can see all of Firelink Shrine, where they started. They can see all of the Undead Berg. They can see where the boss fight took place, the bridge where they fight the dragon. They can see the Undead Parish, and they can see Sen's Fortress. They can see the Duke's Archives and Anna Orlando. This is probably 20 hours of the game compressed into one space, into one frame that the player has access to. They can stand here and see this if they wanted to. What an incredible, what an incredible feat of level design. Imagine all of the people who worked on the geometry and the enemy encounters in this game. All of the men on the walls, on the parapets, along the tunnels, at the gatehouses, in the slums, along the staircases, all of those spaces where we fought enemies. How easy it could have been to just have the player be warped between rooms every so often, chunks of a hundred meters or so, and then just stitch them together with loading screens. What is the level of discipline that it takes to design this entire space just so that the player can go down an elevator before the second boss fight in the game and be returned back to home? It can't have been an accident. Not to mention the poetry in the fact that at the start of the game, when the player reached Violent Shrine and they were told to go find the Bell of Awakening above, that the Bell of Awakening was almost literally above them the entire time, literally above Violent Shrine, and can you guess where the Bell below is? So if you'll allow me to summarize, Dark Souls begins as an oppressive, tense game. It creates and maintains that pressure and tension for the first five or six hours of the game by basically being unapproachable, right? It doesn't hold the player's hand, it doesn't explain to them what they're supposed to be doing with any great depth, and it disorients the player on purpose. It does this knowing that if that pressure is relieved in an honest way, if it's done in a way that the player can then rationalize and understand and then use later that promise that if I can remember where I'm going, if I stay vigilant, I might be able to find shortcuts through this world. I might be able to just get an edge on this game. It creates this perfect moment of catharsis without actually having any characters talking or saying anything. You don't feel for the main character who's feeling relieved. You feel relieved. What a beautiful way to establish a connection with your audience in a way that only interactive media can achieve. And in all the ways that we celebrate Dark Souls, the esoteric storytelling, the grand boss fights, the legacy that it created with Sekiro and Bloodborne and Elden Ring, the Dark Souls series and the creation of a genre, the Soulsborne genre, for all the advancements the future games made, I really don't think any of them come close to reaching this level of direct relationship between the designer and the player in level design. Dark Souls alone makes this promise in such a surprising way in such a delightful way. And for that reason, I revisit it all the time. And I hope you'll revisit it with me because this probably isn't the last video I'll make about Dark Souls and it's probably not the last video I'll make in this fashion. If you liked it, please let me know in the comments below and um, we'll see what we get up to next. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.